certain you know the things that happen in Earnshaw's mm -hmm. office, but basically, but it's, uh, st it's still in your subconscious. It was a blank. Yeah. Well, it, it, that wears off eventually. When it wore off, then I, that's when I, I wrote it up, and uh, so and then when, when I wrote it up, I mean, like, oh my God, uh, it, it, I, I wrote it up and uh, sent it to what I thought was a magazine, and it was actually an internet site, and it, they, they they put it on the internet and. It's it's just it took it's, it took life on the internet it took root, and it, it's the uh, ever since then that's uh, 1996 I put it up there. <laughs> ever since then it's been growing and people putting up fan pages about it and questions about it and all that. And but basically I can tell you what happened. November 22nd, 1963, my dad comes into my bedroom and he said that we're going to go on a trip, uh, and uh, well we're going to go see Dr. Earnshaw and then we're going on a trip. So I thought that we, like we had done automobile uh, trips in Michigan, and I thought that was what was going to happen. And uh, so uh, our house was in Avoca, outside of Avoca. We went up to Yale, Michigan, to the airport there. It's still, you know, like totally dark. Uh, David Perry is there, who was just into all this, and you know was in, in on all this. And uh, Dr. Earnshaw and. Uh, the, uh, Earnshaw and Jack Smith, and they, I think they put me into a box. I couldn't really swear to it. <coughs> I knew they flew me into Dallas. Well, I know they had, well, my dad told me later that they had me in a box. But I think they even put me in a box and flew me in a damn, uh, one of those damn little cargo planes, like a, you know, a little flying box car or something, you know. And uh, so I know that's what they flew me back in because they said they were going to fucking jettison me if they, if they got the order. And, uh, but so anyway, so like, uh, they, they, they put me in a box and, okay, what, the next thing I remember is I'm waking up in the storage room and all that, but like my dad told me they rolled me all over hell in the damn uh, box. Now, David Ferry was an airline pilot, so he had his like fucking pilot's uni uniform on, you know, he looked like really official and all, and uh, so apparently they got me up. They probably like like my dad used to dress really, uh, really tacky. So they probably so as Ferry and my dad, my dad probably had to play the guy that like fucking uh, rolled him up on the uh, on the uh, rolled me up on the, uh, you know the box up on the uh, the uh, hand card or something. I don't know. Anyway, <coughs> I woke so the I wake up in the storage room and uh, I, I I can see they're putting something together. And they were obviously putting the gun together, and they put a hood over my head. Now they had the gun braced to the window, <coughs> and so they like Barry has already shows us like he's got a gun and all that, and he's like ready to shoot both of us, like my dad and me, if anything goes wrong at all. So they're like, they, and I don't really know what's going on because I think I've been like fucking, uh, you know, set up to kill Castro, you know, which is I think okay, that's we'll do it. So anyway, uh, they pretty much drape me over the gun, leave the hood over my head. And then uh, it, 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 the, the, uh, they pull the hood back and uh, they ask if I can see uh, John Kennedy on the little screen, which is being the gun sight and all that. And I say yes, and they give me the order to fire. And I deliberately fired two miss, but I don't know if I did. I may have, I may not have. But I had only the, my only idea was to fire one shot. You know, I figure I had to fire the one shot. And then I'll like uh, fucking pretend I've collapsed. You know, I want to keep, because they already told me to shoot both Kennedy and Con Connolly, you know, I'm supposed to, I'm supposed to keep shooting, I'm supposed to shoot both Kennedy and Connolly. So I fired the one shot, then I throw myself on the floor to the right, and I hit the rifle with the palm of my hand. Now there's an unidentified palm print on, on the Manlicker Carcano, Carcano, that, that there's an if that is the actual rifle, which I don't know for sure, they may have substituted that, but that's my palm print, and that's how it got there. Because I tried to push the damn thing out the window, but it was like braced to the windowsill. <coughs> so anyway, um, I throw myself on the floor, and Ferry jumps on the rifle, keeps shooting, and I can hear more shots out from the street. And then a guy comes in in a suit and all that, and uh, says like, "Did everything go all right?" and all that, and and uh, uh, and, and then one of them, I, I think it's Ferry, says like, "Well, there's the signal. How they got a signal, I don't know. There's the, but there's there's the signal." So we all go, like, <coughs> the guy in the suit, like, splits, and, and me, my dad, and Perry go, like, marching out. We go down to the second floor. Lee Oswald, that we all know, is on the uh, 
second floor, and, and he's sweeping with a, with a push broom, and he doesn't know what's happened. He doesn't even know there's been a fucking assassination. So Perry gets into it with him and pushes him in the chest and all that, and, <coughs> and he says that, you know, we're done with you and all that. Because Lee Oswald was essentially commissioned to kill Castro. He didn't want, he found out. They, they, when they told him that they were going to shoot Kennedy instead, he completely freaked and, you know, would have nothing to do with it. So Perry goes down, like, pushes him in the chest and all, and then we go out another a side stairwell. We, went, we took a side stairwell to the second floor where Lee Oswald was pushing the broom. We took another side stairwell uh, uh, down to the first floor. That's when I tried to run. That's when they came after me and injected me again. And uh, but like um, <coughs> the ferry said, he would not be flying me back to Dallas, and that he was going to stay there in Dallas. And uh, but I was put into a box again. Because I can see the thing is that they said stuff to me even though I was unconscious from the second injection. I could hear things. I could remember some things, and uh, they put me in the bus. And, and they said they they could, they put me on a. Do you know what a flying box car is? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. It's got like yeah yeah. It's got like it, 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 like two prongs. It's like a flatbed truck and all that. <coughs> so they put the box that I was in on that thing and uh, and told me. I mean, what is the point of that? Told me that if they get the orders, they're going to jettison me. But they didn't get the orders to jettison me. And uh, so th that's what happened. I wrote it up in 96, and, you know, I, I, I got threatened, and I got hit by the car. <coughs> and uh, then I got the, the social workers talked to four attorneys in a row and asked them not to take my case. They said they didn't even want my hospital bills paid, much less. Uh, oh, oh, yeah. Now, here's the funny, this is the funny part. I, I don't even. I'm, I'm not even going to name this lawyer, I, I, but you, because the the thing is that what like what difference does it make? But there was. I said there were four attorneys, and every case the the social workers would talk to them, say, no, 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 this guy, you know, is on our enemies list. We don't want him to get um, any kind of. And, and I was seriously injured. You know, I had I had a hernia, I had a bleeding liver, I had uh, post concussion syndrome. I had to learn to talk all over again. I was stumbling around all over the streets. <clears throat> and these social workers are working night and day talking to attorneys. Every attorney say, "No, don't take the case. Don't take the case." I mean, we, they, they, after they took it, they, they talk, social workers say, "Drop it." Okay, the final attorney, I'm not going to name him because I'm going to laugh about his death. That's why I'm not going to name him. The final attorney, uh, the, the, there was a JFK researcher on the East Coast. I'm not going to name any. I'm not going to say which state on the East Coast. They'd be telling too much. Okay, JFK researcher sets me up. There's a three-year statute of limitations on uh, getting money after you get hit by a car. February 1st, 2003, I got hit by the car. The last few months uh, be before the statute ran out on February 1st, 2006, the JFK researcher on the East Coast sets me up with an Ann Arbor attorney. Okay, that's all going smooth. 24 hours before <coughs> the statute of limitations ran out, the, the attorney, the Ann Arbor attorney, calls up uh, the JFK researcher that was setting it up and said, oh, I changed my mind, I'm dropping the case. Uh, goodbye, click. Okay, now, uh, so what I'm thinking in my head, okay, I can't do anything about, it's over, you know, it's three years now, I'll never get any money, I'm going to be a cripple. That, you know, and I'm, I need medical treatment, I don't have any income, I live on the street, and this is forever now, you know. This guy had pulled the rug off the run me at the last instant, and this, but I, I, I said this, you know, I, I, it would never even occur to me to try to pull off something that I know I couldn't do, like to go into his office and throw a bed or something like that. I knew I couldn't do that. What I figured I could do, was that, you know, over a period of weeks or months in the future, weeks, months, and years, every time I got a write-up in the paper, every time I got another uh, uh, comic book or radio show or, t or, or television show with me in it, I'd let them know about it, you know, with a smile on my face while I did it. And I figured, I, okay, every time this guy gets something like this that says my career is going up a, a, a notch, another notch, a notch after that, he's going to sweat. He's going to say, oh my God, you know, this guy is coming up in the world, and uh, what I did, what I, the attorney, did was illegal as hell, 
and someday I'll be called out about it. Well, I had no such option. <coughs> the guy, you know, the guy got the CIA retirement plan for sure. You know, he was a young man. I never met him. I, my, 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 the JFK researcher did all the stuff. But I mean, the attorney, it's like a young, what I, what I was told, a young man in his 40s, you know, 50s, something like that. Basically a young man. A young, uh, uh, a athletic young man that, that uh, with, with, with a great future, just instantly clutches his chest and drops. You know, there's the CIA retirement plan. <clears throat> and so, I mean, I never had the, the chance. There's CIA gratitude. You've got the CIA retirement plan and you've got CIA gratitude. He got both, you know. Uh, but like, so that, 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 that was over. I could never do anything. But anyway, see, the thing is that that's not what anyone cares about. Uh, what people care about are the comic books. And uh, those are coming back on the stands. In fact, I've got a comic on the stands right now at the Labyrinth Comic Shop on State Street uh, across uh, from, from uh, the Diag. It's, it's called Actor Comics Presents and it's for, uh, it's, it's for, uh, it, they, they help out has-been comic book writers. Let me see what I get here. Uh, oh gosh. Yeah. Okay. They help out has-been, it says benefiting comic creators in need, you know. And so they, they help out has-been comic book writers. <coughs> it's, uh, I don't know how many stories, around 20 or something like that. It's a, it's a big, oh, it's at the library, too. But uh, my one? story is on page 47. Which one? This one. Which library? Oh, oh, right down the street. You can check it out. Oh, yeah, yeah, nice. it's in the graphic novel section. It's alphabetically by the title of the comic. And the title is Active Comics. So that puts it up on the top shelf and towards the first and uh, my, st my story, we'll read this right off the cover, says, Hypothetical Service, T. Casey Brennan, comma, Dave Sim, that's the artist, 47 to 52. Then in uh, the contributor biographies, now uh, see, this is, uh, again, this is for helping out has-been comic book people, <coughs> but there's a rather gracious touch to this in that there's a whole list of contributors, and it does, doesn't tell which of these people are the ones giving the charity and which are the ones accepting it, if you know what I mean? Because Stan Lee is in this comic. And so, and, and he wrote this one, uh, The Day the Superheroes Quit. He wrote the first story. It was written by Stan Lee himself. And, 